Could you tell us what your name is and where you were born? Jack Carl Hill, East Grand Rapids. And when you, when the war came around, were you in the Army beforehand? Did you join or were you drafted? I was in the Michigan National Guards. For what? Like, why, why did you join? Well, <clears throat> we were coming out of a deep depression and there was no jobs. And uh, Colonel Hayes was in charge of the guards at that time. And uh, he knew my folks and he said, uh, why don't you come down and I'll put you to work. He said, you can join the guards and you can make a dollar a week. Come down one, one time and, um, for a drill. That sounded pretty good, you know. No one else is working. So that's what we did. So that was the only thing you had to do once you joined? You just had to do that one drill? Or what kind of jobs did they have for you guys to do? Anything come along. We went on maneuvers the first time. And uh, it was just basic training what it was. Did you ever leave Michigan before? Like No, we went over to Wisconsin in our first uh, maneuver. Okay. <clears throat> when was, uh, when were you guys sent over seas? Like, did you do anything before that? Were you sent anywhere else? Like, what was your, your training like before you were sent overseas? Did it prepare you for what? I mean, <clears throat> for uh, Army? Right. We were federalized on October 15th, 1940. And from there, we went to Beauregard, Louisiana for training for one year. I ended up, I was in there for five years. And uh, at that time, we made $21 a month. So that was pretty good money. And... Uh, Camp Beauregard wasn't ready for us. It was just a damn big field. And uh, we had tents, and they were, then they finally got Camp Livingston, which was about 15 miles down the road. And we had bathrooms and whatnot there, and good, good facilities. How old were you when all this happened? Like when I you was, uh, I joined, I was 17. When I got down to uh, Louisiana, I was 18, just turned 18. Do you remember from your basic training in the States, where did you go from there? What was your first overseas assignment? From Louisiana? Right. Well, the war was declared on December 7th. Then they, we were ready to go to Europe. But uh, so they sent us to Boston, Camp Devens. And from Devens, um, General MacArthur wanted us. Japan had declared war on us, so uh, they switched us and they sent us all the way to San Francisco. And then from San Francisco, we went headed for Australia. And then, and at San Francisco, um, they had no place to put us. You know, you got a regiment, so they had a cow palace there, and that's where they stuck us till we get on the boat. And nothing was ready. Everything was always behind time. And uh, Cow Palace Mountain, just like the Cow Palace, too. And we were there for about four days, I think, <laughs> sitting in the seats. That's where we slept. What was your reaction to Pearl Harbor? What did you think? Well, uh, I don't think anybody uh, knew it was coming. Uh, it happened and uh, made the best of it. So... Your first overseas like, deployment was to Australia, and then from Australia, what happened next? Well, uh, I can little tell you a little bit on the boat, if you'd like to know. Yeah, on the great. ship, the Lure Line, uh, we finally got loaded. They they had to paint the thing white or gray, from white to gray, uh, and we left the harbor there. Uh, it was just getting dusk, and it was a. Uh, the waves were about 20 feet high, and the boat was going like this. And you ever seen everybody seasick? Well, if you weren't, if you didn't get seasick, you watch these guys throwing up, you would get seasick. Uh, I happened to, didn't uh, get sick, but uh, we went down and uh, they had waiters down below in the cafeteria, not the uh, dining room. And this was a, a civilian ship, so they had waiters waiting on you. And uh, we had good food. 
but it took about five or six days for all the rest of the guys to settle down and uh, uh, from and turning green so they could eat something. And um, uh, let's see, I crossed the international date line, May 7th. That happened to be my birthday. So I skipped to the 8th. And I asked the captain, I said, that make me a, a day younger? <laughs> he says, no. <laughs> he got a kick out of it. And after that, why, uh, it came over the radio that uh, a baton and Krigador it was lost. And MacArthur, at that time, I think he took six PT boats, his wife and, and uh, some of his staff. And he was ordered to get to Australia. And, and uh, we were quite concerned then because we were out there, no, no backup uh, in case we got sunk. And uh, uh, see, I'll tell you, uh, there was one of the crew, Merchant Marines, died. And they buried him at sea. Well, these sailors are superstitious guys, you know. And uh, they come around and bet that we never, never hit Australia, never make it. And they started making bets with us. So I figured, well, if, I, if we're going to make it, I, what, what do I got to lose? <laughs> so I, I think I bet, I made about 20 bucks off of them. We got to Adelaide, Australia. Away. They sure hated to pay us. We had to chase them all over the deck to find them. <laughs> so <clears throat> once you land in Australia, you guys, you were shipped up. You were shipped up north, weren't you? We landed in Adelaide. First thing they did, they put us on a train. And uh, the damn thing didn't go more than five feet, and it jumped the track. So they had to unload us. Then they brought some trucks in there. We call them uh, lorries. They're charcoal burners. So it, it took them about uh, ten hours to get us back to a camp. It was an open field again, uh, and. Uh, so we stayed there for a while, and then, then we took a convoy up to Brisbane uh, and started Camp Cable. What were the Australians like toward you Americans coming into the... We were their saviors. Uh, uh, they, um, their regular army was over in, in Africa fighting. So they only had a few ground troops there left. They had nobody. If the, if the Japanese made a mistake instead of going to New Guinea, they should have went right, right to Australia. And uh, Australians had given up half their country uh, already. They anticipated they were going to lose that. <clears throat> so your experiences with them was generally pretty good. The troops themselves, did the Australian troops that were there today, all what they had, you know, what the, what the troops they had were over New Guinea, and they were getting beaten up bad. So, <clears throat> from the north coast of Australia, from there you went to was it it was Bruna, was it, it was New Guinea. Yeah. And tell us about your like experience going over there and what you thought when you got. Well, there. we had three three Liberty ships. We had ev everything got to be by threes. So if we lost one, well, we would lose everything. Even if we had a comb or toothbrush or whatever, <laughs> one was on <laughs> for each. Um, and uh, MacArthur would give an order to pay us. Uh, I don't know what the hell we're going to do with the money. <laughs> no place to spend it. But so we all got card games and we played cards. And I remember one time that uh, I made. Uh, I think I had about five, a little over five thousand dollars, and I went to my uh, major Snipke, who's a good friend of mine. I said, to "Snip, I said, you see that five thousand dollars gets to my folks because they could buy a home in Brenton Village for about five thousand dollars, brand new." And he says, looked at me, and he says, "Okay, on one condition." He said, don't come back and ask me for any. Well, that's okay. 
So I had about $500 left. I went back, and about two hours later, I was broke. <laughs> and I went back to the general, you know, and he ended up being a general. Uh, I said, Snip, I said, can I have a little money? Not in your life. <laughs> so we started playing for matches and whatnot. But we, we got to Moresby and, uh, and unloaded the ships. And then we started setting up a camp, tents and whatnot, at, at uh, Camp Mes Mor and Moresby. And how, what were the conditions like in that camp? Was it? Well, they were, we were pretty good, uh, pretty good soldiers by then. I think that uh, we could get along with almost anything. Um, they all, we, one thing we had a little shovel. It was supposed to dig a slick trench or something. And, we thought, what the hell, we don't need that, you know. We didn't dig one, but then uh, the Japs used to come over the planes at night, and uh, they were trying to bomb us or the airport. I think it was mostly the air, airstrip. And we would sit there and hold our heads up watching them. Geez, pretty soon our neck would get stiff, you know. Somebody decided, well, we'll lay down and we'll have to bend our necks. And that got along all right. And then about two days or three days later, why, they missed the airport. And when the daisy cutters come down, and about two o'clock in the morning, I was sleeping. And I woke up, uh, I was up in the air. And everything was red around me. And that blast you could hear, you couldn't believe it. I couldn't hear for a while. But uh, uh, I come down the ground. And you could hear a lot of the guys got screaming and hollering. They got really bad, cut up bad. This uh, one guy by the name of Fletcher, he lost his kneecap. And we had a, a doctor here from Grand Rapids. I'm not going to mention his name, but he was one of the bravest guys I ever saw. Uh, I helped him. He uh, had a whole tourniquet on him and took the kneecap right off. And, Burnt flesh is stinking, and, and he was the guy who was crying. And the uh, doctor was going to take, had to take the rest of his leg off, and, uh, which he did. And there was a whole bunch of other guys that were bad. And I told Fletcher then, I said, Fletcher, the war's all over for you. You're going home. But I didn't make him feel any better. But anyway, I, I was going around to see what I could do. And I come to this one guy. And, he was cut up so damn bad. He, uh, he just begged me, he says, he'll shoot me. And geez, I looked at him and I started pulling my pistol out. And I almost had it out of there. And I said, don't bet, damn, I ain't going to do it. So I hollered for a medic and a medic got over there. And I never saw that guy again. And I never know if he made it or not. But oh, 30 years later, we had a reunion. And I saw this guy, and geez, he looks familiar. And he come up to me, and he says, you remember me? And I knew, I knew who it was, and I said, you want me to shoot you? He said, you suck. Give me a big hug. And I talked to him. He's from Arizona now, and he had married and got three kids. And we sat the rest of the, rest of the night there talking to him, shooting the ball. Do you remember when the first man died in your platoon? Do you remember who that was or how that happened? Uh, and, uh, well, the first guy we lost is, was Cable. We named a camp after him. That was in Australia. Um, in um, um, Port Moresby, or not Port Moresby, but uh, uh, in Buna. Going to Buna, we lost quite a few guys. Yeah, I held a, I held a couple guys in my arms. At the captain, it was Captain Numbers, and there was John Shirley, who was the captain, and they always, um, you know, it seems that um, the commission officers got to, got killed quicker. But it just seemed that way, and they always, our, our, our guys that. Uh, like I was a I was a corporal at that time, and um, I was offered a commission. 
our battle wasn't going worth a darn. We, we were not trained. We weren't equipped right. We didn't have the food. We, we, we should have never been in that battle. Because we weren't, weren't ready for it. We weren't jungle fighters. We had no training. We had uh, equipment that was for uh, Europe, not for uh, a jungle. And we, nobody knew anything about the jungle. The officers didn't either. And that, 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 uh, for the first month there, well, it, was, it was bad. MacArthur wanted to win a battle. He wanted to win that battle, period. And uh, we weren't going that wood. So what did you personally think of MacArthur yourself? Well, a lot of guys didn't like him. But they didn't realize he didn't have nothing either. He had no equipment. He had nothing. He had just us guys. He, I know he wanted to win that battle, and he, uh, reserved, he uh, we had a general by the name of Harding, was a nice guy, and he didn't want us to go against the pillboxes and whatnot. We were getting slaughtered, and we were inexperienced to begin with. Uh, he sent uh, General Eichelberger up, the three-star general, and uh, told him, he said, um, I want to go up there and win this, relieve the general that's up there. Um, I want you to win this battle or don't come back. And Eichelberger came up and he didn't realize what the war was about. He didn't think MacArthur did either. But um, uh, we finally won the damn battle. He told uh, MacArthur, told uh, the general, he says, take the sergeants and, and, uh, and the corporals, make them officers. Take the officers that won't fight, relieve them. But uh, he, I don't think we had to relieve any of them. I think all of them were scared. Hell, I was scared. Everybody was scared. Anybody tells you they weren't scared is full of bull. <clears throat> and when he came up there, he had three stars on his on his hat, and I told him, he bumped into me, was, and he said, where, where is uh, General uh, Harding? I said, down here, it was headquarters with him. And he had a staff with him. I said, General, I said, you better take those stars off. You won't be here the rest of the day. They'll get you. There's snipers all over the place. And he said to me, he looks down at me, he was a tall guy. And he said, what rank were you? I said, I'm a corporal. He said, you're a sergeant right now. <laughs> but uh, he, he got things organized, and uh, we finally won the battle. What did, you, what did you think your chances of surviving were at that time? Uh, not worth a damn. I carried a Thompson submachine gun in a 45. And, uh, I've gotten a lot of scraps. I was with the Aussies one time and on the line there, and we were, the Japs had us pinned down, and I was firing a Thompson submachine gun, you know, and some of the ammunition wasn't worth a damn either. <laughs> Pardon my French, but uh, I was firing it, and all of a sudden it jammed. So I had to reach up like this and jack that shell out. And as soon as I did, I, I had my hand and my finger on that trigger yet. And the old bullets were pshh, And this Australian, he was looking over to see what's the matter with me. And he said, Jesus, mate, he said, she almost knocked my head off. <laughs> I said, what the hell are you doing standing up there for? <laughs> well, <laughs> later on, you know, I got a kick out of him. He got to know him pretty good. Uh, he came back after the war. He came into, uh, into Washington as an observer uh, on the staff. He came to Grand Rapids and he looked me up and he gave me a, the golden kangaroo cross. Or well, not a cross, but a golden kangaroo. Kangaroo. And he uh, shot the bull and sat and had dinner. And it was interesting. What did you think of the Australian troops overall? You oh, think they helped Oh, you? damn good. We couldn't beat them. Couldn't beat them. They were, they were going through hell, too. But 
they're a good. They had, but they had equipment like we had. We had to have, we should have had tanks and and whatnot when we started there. But we didn't have nothing. Do you remember, like, the sound and the smell of what, like, the jungle? Like they said, the jungle has a smell to it that. They had uh, not only the smell, but the bodies, and uh, they'd bloat right up, you know, uh, that hot sun. And, uh, we, we, you know, dysentery, we, had, we didn't have latrines, nothing. In fact, at half time, we didn't even have water to drink. <clears throat> so, like malaria, did you ever get malaria? I had bad. Yeah. I ended up in a field hospital. After it was after we won the battle, I had another job I didn't like. But uh, I was on a I was on the S four staff, and. Uh, The colonel said, uh, we got to do something with these bodies. This was before we even won the battle. And uh, we had, so um, he says, take care of these. Make sure we get some graves started here. And, and he said, I said, well, we're going to get into some, we had some high ground there. So that's where I picked out. Because I'll tell you a little later about the, about the low ground. You don't want to dig in that because it fills right up with water. But um, um, we had these graves all set in the body bags and getting these guys, uh, putting them in a bag, it wasn't fun. Uh, we had to have one, we got some crosses and cut one ser um, serial number in, the, in this bag and one on the, on the, on the cross so we know where, who was in that grave. And, um, I did that for quite a while. Uh, one time, I, we were doing uh, get burying of some of these guys, and damn Jap zeros come over and strafing the hell out of us. And, uh, I jumped in. <laughs> it's like the slit trench there. I jumped right in the slit trench, in the, in the graves, <laughs> and uh, on top of this guy. Well, I'm laying in there. Why? Those damn Jap zeros are shooting us. We we're coming about this far above my about me, so I just reached around and pulled the, the body right over on top of me, and I got below him. <laughs> and, um, uh, but we got that job done. It, uh, the bodies were, it was, it, the stink was real bad. What did you think of the Japanese soldiers as soldiers and people? And fighters. They were ruthless bastards. You know, they, uh, we were up against uh, uh, the, uh, the Japanese Imperial 18th, I think it was the 18th Army. They had come all the way from, they went through China, Japan, or, and all the way uh, India, down through that Burma, into the Philippines. And um, they, they, uh, they were good fighters, but uh, they, didn't, they were ruthless bastards. They just got you just like with a bayonet, just as soon as anything. <clears throat> and they were well trained too. They've been through this, you know. We were. They had foxholes at, uh, in um, uh, machine gun pits, uh, bunkers, and they all, they had brains enough. They had been through it long enough. They they choose the high ground. So, uh, but we were stupid. We're not stupid, but we didn't know. <laughs> we would dig any place in the low, and it would fill right up with water. And uh, like in uh, at uh, Moresby, why we when we got bombed that time, why everybody started using those shovels, start making slit trenches in, and they knew what the hell was going on. And so we made a great big bunker, <laughs> cut down uh, some. Coconut trees and put a top on it, you know. And we thought, well, hell, that'll take a, it'll take a bomb. Well, little did we know, they come over and start bombing us again, and 
So I jump in that damn thing, it's full of water, like that. And all the mosquitoes in the world in there, he's <laughs> having a field day on us. So after that, why? We, uh, we waited, for, we heard the whistle of a bomb coming down. <laughs> and we knew it was going to be close to us. So then we jumped in at the, with the mosquitoes. But uh, uh, we, we learned. That was just something that we didn't know. <clears throat> so what about prisoners, then? Pardon? Prisoners, like. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have a drink in a minute. Okay. We should probably move on from Kuna and start going to the Are you interviewing? Are you going to, Luke, are you going to do all the questioning? Or? Uh, he's been writing questions, oh, okay, but so yeah. Kind of yeah, feel free to, you know, both of you ask questions if you want. I just didn't want to, like, start talking, like, if he started talking, I start talking, like, well, at the same uh, time, so yeah. I figured this. Okay, well, for, uh, okay. And also remember to visualize. If you can't visualize what he's talking about, then you're not getting what you need. Then let him, let him describe it. Let him it. describe it in a follow-up question. Yep. Going good though. Just stop for a second. So, you know, we, we got to pass off this kind of function. <laughs> yeah, we're actually paying attention, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to remember all that stuff. So, like, would they just refuse to surrender them? Was there, like, prisoners or? No, there was a, we didn't like them, they didn't like us. And uh, I remember back in Port Moresby, why, it's at Fort Buna, whatever there, why, uh, this Australian or somebody brought a Jap up. And they're, they're, they're taking a prisoner, and they were taking him back to Australia. And uh, this Aussie come over. He says, "Step aside, Yank." And, uh, guy said, "What are you going to do? Tell him to shoot that bastard." And I, I, I didn't like that at all. And he shot him. I, I didn't go for that. <clears throat> Afterwards, why well, you get to know what they're doing to you? Why well, it's a different ball game then. So from the Buna campaign and whatnot, you guys moved down from there. What, after that whole campaign wrapped up, what, where'd you guys go from there? Um, I, well, after that, I ended up somehow, I don't know what happened to me, but I ended up in a hospital, a field hospital. And I had malaria bad, and, and uh, it does knock you down and blank you out. I ended up in this field hospital, and uh, this guy, uh, they were getting straight one day. I must have come to then. There, there's a slip trench right here, and I was on his cot. This old guy was, he looked old to me, you know, but I was a young guy, you know, looked about 35. That was old. And uh, he says, Jack, he says, you're in bad shape. He says, I want you to make sure you take that Adderbrin. And he said, if you start to throw up, I want you to put your hand over your mouth and swallow it. And you keep doing it. And I said, okay. I'm going to start getting strafed. And you sit there. And I said, okay, okay. Most of the guys were in the, well, they could, were getting in, you know, slit trenches or, uh, there. And I got to thinking that later. I said, one of the guys, oh, who is that old guy? He said, what guy? So I had a guardian angel. And uh, it was, uh, I think he was with me all the way. Because I could have got killed about a hundred times. I should have gotten killed, but I didn't. What was a slip trench? What did it look like? Well, you dig a hole. <laughs> if you want, didn't want to go down because of the water, you dig it this way. Just so you could creep up and get in there, about four feet down. So when I got strafed way, or uh, the Jap was shooting at you, he couldn't hit you. 
<clears throat> it's just a safety net. What was religion like, like in your guys' platoon? Pardon? Like religion, what was it like in your platoon? Was it like there are a lot of Christian guys over here and the guys? Oh, there, there, I tell you, you know, you're going to be a, you're going to be a Christian in a hell of a hurry. <laughs> uh, mentioned that way. We had a priest. They, uh, they named him the Jungle Priest from Wyandotte, and I can't remember his name now. Uh, he got hit. And uh, this is the first part of where in New Guinea. Um, so we, we uh, he had his little bag there and his two bottles of wine. So hell, we, we figured he didn't need those. So Gedris and Swicky and I decided to have him drink them. And they're both Catholic. I wasn't. So then they started feeling guilty the next day. So we better go see the Padre. So I said, well, I'll go with them. We went there, and there was the old Padre. And never started a confession you know, to him. And, but, and I said, well, it was really my fault, Padre. I said, I'm not one that got started. And he said, well, they said, that. don't worry about that. That was just wine. You know, they, they do their thing over the wine for the blessed and whatnot. And, but, uh, uh, you're, you're, I think everybody's a Christian then. So did you not go back with the division back to Australia for that year? I was with, yeah, sure. <clears throat> I was probably one of the oldest guys with the outfit. Uh, I made every landing. We landed uh, from there. We went to uh, Sadar. Then we went to uh, Atapi, Hollandia, Moratai Island. And from there to uh, Leyte. And uh, I made that was with the longest, I think. What were those campaigns like as in comparison to Buna? Let's start with Sidar. Oh. Sidar? Yeah. Um, we had more equipment. We had better equipment. We had something to eat. <laughs> we had more equipment. And uh, MacArthur was getting his things in. And at, before that, MacArthur had nothing. But uh, we had planes, and uh, we were coming up good. Uh, Sadar there, uh, we had to go in uh, by barge. And uh, uh, we, had, uh, we had practice in it before that. We went to Newcastle in Australia, and we practiced on barges going in and whatnot. And, uh, I learned one thing when that barge went down, why you make sure you're going off it, that you're not going off in deep water, which they would uh, happen a lot. See? And we had a guy by El Sawicki, he was short, and uh, we always jumped him in first. If the water <laughs> come up too far, we'd pull him back. And uh, at one time, yeah, we were way out, out of line, and I talked back to the guy and said, hey, Get us in for a closer. He said, I'll get they're afraid of getting bogged down. And I call him a damn uh, Navy guy. He said, Don't you call me a Navy guy? He says, I'm a Coast Guard. <laughs> we laughed about that one. And uh, but uh, yeah, we got we landed the first landed and uh, we set up a headquarters there, had a radio and uh, turned the radio on and here comes Tokyo Rose. She said, uh, uh, we know you're there. And she says, why don't you just surrender now? She said, we're going we're gonna to be over tonight. We're going to bomb the hell out of you. And she was right. They did. And uh, oh, it was, uh, I, I got it written down how many days we're there. But it, was, it worked out pretty good. At least we had hammocks to sleep in, and uh, we set up a perimeter there with uh, cans. Uh, the pigs used to come around, and they rattle the cans, and and we think right away it would be they were coming after the Japs were coming back, counterattacking. But uh, <clears throat> what role did our artillery play in the combat? Pardon? What role did artillery play in the combat that you were in? Not very much. I don't. I don't remember even having the artillery in the. I think we did, but uh, I don't remember it. 
And that's in Cedar. May have it later. But I, I didn't remember it. Can you tell us about your experiences at uh, iTape? Is that how you pronounce Pardon? it? Pardon? I didn't hear you. Can you tell us about your experiences at iType? Oh, uh, uh, Atapi? Atapi, yeah. Oh, I'll get back to uh, uh, Cedar. I'll tell you a couple of the nice ones after a while. I, we had uh, these hammocks, you know, and uh, tie them on these. They looked like trees, but you tie a hammock in there. And, uh, by morning, the damn things would bend right over. <laughs> It'd be on the ground here. But uh, there was a couple of switchy and getters. We used to pull jokes too, when we, you know. And, and uh, one time there was a bright moon, and I had my hammock all set, and we were over here. And I went to get my hammock, and and uh, I had my blanket back here, and it was something I laid down, and it was, uh, I, th I thought it was my canteen, and. Uh, Pull the blanket back and <laughs> the Jap's head. <laughs> Those damn guys put under there. And as soon as you move fast, you know, that thing just spins right around the hammocks. <laughs> oh, I got even a couple, I forgot, we, we pulled jokes on each other once in a while, you know. And this Al Sawicki, he was stuttered. And when it, this one just got dark. You know, There's no moon. It was dark. You don't move. You stay right where you are, see. And I always slept, I had my 45, I always had my 45 here. And I don't know, it was early in the morning, dark as hell. And I could feel someone on my hammock on the screen, feel my screen. So I cocked that thing right away. And I went, where was it? He shouldn't have been there. And it was Al Sawicki. He got up to take a leak, and he got lost. <laughs> he started, no, 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 no. I almost did, too. <laughs> Cause that, you know, those Japs, boy, they'd put a bayonet in you real quick. But, uh, so we had uh, we had some good times there. And about Sadar, why, we made, um, between two mountains, it was a big strip. And we had uh, B-54s, or B-50s, B-50s. There were six of them that uh, were running out of gas. and. Uh, we didn't, they didn't think we were there yet at, in Sadar. And so they come in, they belly landed them. And they, as they come in, why, one would go this way, and one would go that way, and one would go this way, one would go that way. And we were counting up the dollars. <laughs> and not one, one guy got hurt. But uh, one of them didn't make it. And I'd seen the paper the other day that uh, had a picture. There, uh, these guys were uh, military men were uh, had this casket with a flag on it. They had found the bodies of these guys in that plane in, in New Guinea after all these years. And they're buried in that Darlington. Did the government ever like, send out any entertainment to you guys? Was there ever any? Oh, Bob Hope, yeah. Yeah. He, he was in Australia. Yeah. Jerry Colonna. But uh, uh, getting back to the toppy there, that was a, that was another one that uh, and we heard that uh, the Japs were back and coming back and back and landing back of the Marines. So at that time, we we put we had anti tank guns now. Uh, we should see that was another thing that we never had before. Um, we always kept about four of them on the. Where we landed, pointing out. So in case they did come around us, why we had some ammunition there for them. <clears throat> did they bring up tanks against you a lot? The uh, Japs? No. No. So you were using the anti-tank as anti-infantry, anti or? Yeah, and barges, anything we come in and blast them. The, the, they had tanks in the Philippines. That's what you're referring to. That's when they, they come after us. In Hollandia, that was a that was another landing that was up the coast. Uh, these were all up the coast of New Guinea. <clears throat> but that wasn't a that wasn't a bad deal either. They finally made that a. They used to be a big missionary. 
uh, Dutcher. He was a Dutch. And uh, up on the up on the hill, there was a uh, a building, a wooden building, was banged up, but that's where the nuns were. And they said, but, uh, one of my guys, Clocko, Aloysius Alfonso Clocko, he was up there, getting up that way, and uh, one of his snipers was pinning him down. And Clocko wasn't that good a shot. I shouldn't be telling him, my <laughs> Kim will get mad at me. But you know, <laughs> And I carried a Thompson submachine gun. I couldn't reach him with that. And the clock was in the hill. Come on, Wicker. I said, what's the matter, clock? Oh, and he said, that damn Jap's up there. And I can't get him. He said, you're, you're the expert shot. He said, give me that 45. Give me that M1. And I pointed and I watched. He'd stick his head out and he'd shoot down there. I said, clock, oh, what do you want me to get? <laughs> just, we're just shooting a bull, see? He says, five bucks. There's a five bucks on the left eye. And he looks at me. One shot. That's okay. <laughs> I'm at damage and damn sure I zeroed in on him, you know. Damn. He got his head out there. He pulled it back too fast. I got him in the right. <laughs> it cost me five bucks. I never forgot that. <laughs> but he was after us, so. <laughs> Were you ever in any trouble at all in the military? Yeah, <laughs> I got <laughs> I got court-martialed. In fact, uh, back in Brisbane, we took us back from. I'm sorry, Jack. To interrupt you before you tell the story, can you just pardon? Can you remove your hand? Yeah. Just thank um, you. I got on the colonel's staff and and um, I used to drive him in a command car and. Um, there was a lot of accidents, and uh, we had a General Gill that said that uh, he was getting ticked off with everybody's trucks and everything were getting in accidents. So he wanted the MPs, the division MPs, uh, to start giving tickets out. So I had the colonel in uh, um, Major Snipke. He ended up three-star general. He's a buddy of mine, too, now. Was. Okay. Um, they wanted to go to town, so. I drove and hurry up, hell. We got, I don't know what they had to do, but they were in a hurry. Hell, I was going about 45 miles an hour as fast as that damn car go. And MPs pulled me over, you know. Oh, this is what I had in the back seat, you know. And they were shooting, writing me out a ticket, though. And they were explaining to him that the general, you know, gave the orders. So I got the ticket. And I throw it out. So about two weeks went by. And I get a call, and this was in Brisbane. Camp Cable, uh, report to headquarters uh, for a summary court martial. Summary court martial, what the hell? So I go up there and there's a whole bunch of guys. Whoever drove a truck or a car well, <laughs> had a ticket. So I went in there and see there's our colonel and, and a couple of caps and a major and a lieutenant, you know. Boy, they really dolled it up. So I went in there and I slew the colonel, and he starts reading me a, this article, and I looked at him, and he says, how do you plead? I said, what is that for? I don't understand it. He said, for speeding. I said, Gildy, <laughs> you know, he's with me. So he reaches up and gets his hammer and knocks it down there, and I find you $15. Reach in his pocket, he says, here's, here's my hat, Jack. <laughs> Now, that's the kind of guy. He got killed, but that's the kind of guy he was. Real, real prince of a guy. He was a West Pointer, and, and uh, he, uh, he uh, first when he first joined us, he didn't think much of the National Guards. <laughs> you know, he was a regular uh, Army guy. But he got to like us all. But then, uh, I got, I got, you want to get in court much? I got another one. Eh? <laughs> I was in, the, we're in the Philippines. And uh, we had all the, we had aircraft carriers, battleships. Uh, uh, you can't believe what we had there. We had a whole Navy. And 
I looked out there at the desk, and I said, God, I can't believe it. We're going into Leyte. And uh, my barge was the first one going in, so we went down the rope ladder and, and got in the barge. And uh, I said, what in the hell? There can't be anybody alive. And they're blasting away. And, uh, got in there and said, my guys want to go down the road. I said, stay off that damn road. We're going down in the bushes. And that's where we went. And the Japs were, they were there. And uh, so uh, we got in there. We got headquarters. And we started making the drive. And well, two or three days later, why, I uh, was up in the front. And I had two, two of my buddies. They had, we had two 50 caliber uh, guns, aircraft guns. And I knew, and was, I, well, any guy I had any experience knew a Jap uh, engine. They run reversed. It sounded and all the other different. And it was pretty nice light then, just getting dusk. And uh, here comes this damn Jap bomber or transport. We couldn't tell which it was, but we knew by the engine. And uh, his two buddies said, Hill, what do you want to do? I said, take it. Jesus, every, 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 every other bullet is a, a red tracer, so you, can, you know you're, you're hitting it. See? And they just riddled the hell out of it. You could hear it spit and sputter when it bites. And oh, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes later, away, up comes a colonel. Oh, Lord. You could tell by the nice uniform he had on, khaki. He <laughs> had old greens like we had. Who got the order to shoot one of our planes down? Uh -huh. I said I did, but it wasn't it wasn't one of ours. It was a jet plane. And he says that was uh, one of our planes. He says all our navies out there, they all got uh, radar equipment, and you give did you hear them firing? You give the order to shoot one of our planes down. He says you're going to get the biggest damn court martial this army's ever had. He said, maybe I thought, holy crap, maybe I was wrong. <clears throat> he said, I'll be back tomorrow morning. He said, don't you leave this spot. He turned around and went, oh, boy, two gunners, that was my fault, you know. And they felt sorry. And I said, Jesus, I swear, that was a Jap. <laughs> you never know, he had convinced us. But what he forgot, that it was a Jap bomber, and it was below the radar. They come in low. Well, and when he came up the next day, next morning, and he said, uh, Sergeant, he said, that was a Jap bomber, or Jap transport bomber. He said, what they were, were going to do is try to take the airfield back. And, I, and he says, uh, I'm going to put you in for the medal. I said, I don't need a medal. I said, I'm getting the hell out of here. I was mad. I didn't, you know, I felt real bad all the rest of the night. Uh, kill, kill your own guys. Uh, so I went to our General Gill, and he had that order out now. He could keep you if you had a court martial, a summary court martial. In other words, I had points. I had 300 some points, and it only took 125 to, to get home, to get on the furlough or go home for permanently, rotation. What you call it today, and uh, but I couldn't. I had all those points because he wanted to keep us, the seasoned guys. So we, when we went in Japan, we had he had seasoned guys, and uh, so I went up and told him. I said, General, I said he knew what happened already. I says, I'm going home on that furlough. And he says, I don't blame him. He says, there's a liberty ship out here. He says, you can be on it and you can uh, go this afternoon. Said, oh, I got the hell out of there. I get on this liberty ship, and I think I'm going right back to the States. <clears throat> Jeez, I should smell some nice bread, you know. And I went over and I said, hey, can I have a slice of that bread? I haven't had a slice of bread in two years. No, no, can't do that. He said, yeah, well, no. They had some, I had a cup of, cup of coffee, and we were out there, I don't know, a couple hours, and all of a sudden I look up, and here comes this guy, chat bomber, right over the stack. 
There was a bomb. I looked up, and there's a bomb day. Doors open. And that bomb, I didn't see that damn bomb. And I thought to myself, this is the way I'm going to get it on the way home. Well, he pulled that button a little too late, and it went right over the bow. And boy, what a blast. And then he circled, and he's going to come in the side and hit us in the side. So I got on one gun, and one of the other guys got on the other gun. And they were 50 calibers, and we know how to work them. And we had both of those guns, every damn bullet going right up, well, dead head right onto them. And I'll bet it wasn't 200 yards away from us. I kept thinking, what the hell's keeping him up? He's going to end up hitting us. And all of a sudden, <laughs> we blew him up. And then this time now, we're, I'm, we're mad as hell because they didn't have anybody on the ship to take care of that stuff. And we went and find the captain. It was an ensign. Uh, it was a young a black um, a sailor. Captain, we would call him the captain. And uh, he says, this is my first time out. And we were surprised that uh, he was, you know, because uh, very seldom you see a black officer. And uh, I said, well, whatever you're doing, just get us going. I said, if he radioed back, well, we're going to have some more problems. And uh, so we'll take care of the guns. And uh, OK, he, boy, he had the radio down that damn Liberty ship was going like hell. And I said, where are you headed for? Boy, he said, we're going back to, I'm headed for uh, Hollandia, New Guinea. I said, you're yeah, not either. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm supposed to be in the United States. <laughs> well, that we went. But we didn't get hit again, and we made a safe trip. But anyway, getting back to that bread, you know, I says, you know, I, I like, sure like a slice of bread. He said, I'll give you the whole damn loaf. <laughs> Two guys. <laughs> so we got some bread. But we got back to Lindia, and uh, then we waited, and I had to get on the lure line. The lure line come in, wait for that. That was going to go to the United States. But there's a whole bunch of Canadians on there. So we get on the, the lure line. That's the big ship we went over, come over on. And it's going back to Brisbane <laughs> to take these sailors. <laughs> so I went back to Brisbane. Well, I ended up, I was in the hospital. I never made it any further. And I, get, I didn't even get off the boat. And uh, then we sailed back to the United States. But uh, there's another cute little story. I don't care if you tell it or not. But this captain of the lure line. He always said, if a man goes overboard, we're not stopping to pick him up. That's, you know, because he didn't have subs. And here, this guy, we had a couple of guys that were um, shell shocked him. And he had his just a pair of shorts on, white shorts. <laughs> Somehow he got out and he jumped off the boat, off the ship. And someone threw him a life jacket, a life preserver, one of the round ones. He's sitting in there, he's paddling away from the ship. <laughs> And we, uh, he stopped the damn ship and started turning around. And we had over the lifeboat, and two of the sailors got on after him. And one sailor watched him. He took his oar and he hit him right in the back of the head, boom. <laughs> and we thought, you know, he really had to be nuts because going, coming back home, he doing it way. Going over had been different. Can you tell us uh, about your experiences at Morotai? At where? Morotai. Morotai? Yeah. Yeah? That was an island of about, uh, oh, let's see, maybe 20, mi 20 miles long. And I'm guessing now, maybe four miles wide. And it was all full of, it used to be an airstrip. And we needed that to take uh, a landing strip take that for a landing strip so the planes could, from there, go to the Philippines. They couldn't reach the Philippines without that. So they took photographs of it, and it looked just like a regular nice landing strip. So they dropped us off there, and <laughs> it looked pretty, but the kunine grass is up here. And that's like a razor, that grass. With their photographs, it, sh it showed that uh, just the bottom part, you know, like a, like a field. So 
we went in and uh, packed our way in there and about uh, halfway uh, in while we set up a headquarters. And uh, Colonel said, well, where are we? And I said, right about here, sir. I had the maps. And, oh, okay. So how would you know that? I said, I got the map. Oh, he was our, our West Pointer. And he always says, when I got his job, I got the job for him, you know. He said, Jack, I want to tell you one thing. When I ask you something, don't ever, ever tell me you don't know. <laughs> Say, I'll find out. And when I told him that, you know, he looked at me. He got that grin on his face, you know. <laughs> like he knew what I meant. But, uh, he was just, I didn't say I don't know. But uh, well, we took that. About two days later, the, uh, the engineers come in, Army engineers. They mowed that sucker right down, and we had planes flying out of there. Uh, well, Water? Yeah, I'll take a look. That's my job.